Well, this evening I uh, ask for some volunteers to come up and help me, so I'm going to have them come up here, and they're going to get started. And we're going to play a little game here in a couple minutes. But while they're getting ready, um, just shout some things out. What are things that you love? Ice cream, fantastic. Way to go, Joe. Cheesecake, all right. Chiefs. Sure. Wendy, very good. Way to get the brownie points. Good job. <laughs> right after baseball, I heard that too from somebody. Sherry. Is that true, Wendy? Do you take second after baseball? <laughs> As long as it's not, as long as it's summertime, it's second. Okay. What are some other things? Shoes. Shoes. What did you say? Your bed. All right. Video games. Okay. Food auctions. There we go. I do enjoy food auctions. What? Did someone say liver and onions? That is wrong. Like in every way that is wrong. Wow. Steak? I can, I can get that one. Oh. Love has many meanings. Um, I looked it up in Webster. And there's at least 13 different definitions for love. Um, as we've seen here, we say we love foods. Um, we use the love, we use the word love for clothing, other various frivolous things. Um, and then we use the word love for our deepest relationships and the way we relate to God. Are you guys about ready back here? Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's, let's go back here, then we'll come back to love. So what we're going to do is they don't know what they're about to eat. And uh, I'll set this down. And Jacob is going to stand in front of them so that you can't see what they're about to eat either. And I'll grab the mic here. Can we use this mic, Dennis? And they're not going to tell you what they're eating but they're going to describe what it tastes like. Okay. All right. Don't show it. Never done this before. Oh, we didn't see it. No, we didn't. That's a big bite. <laughs> <laughs> Here, hold this over here. Right there. Right about there. So what's it taste like? Describe it. Texture, um, flavors. It's sweet. And I don't know. What texture is it? I don't know. It's sweet. Um. You are failing miserably. <laughs> Any guesses what she ate? It's sweet. <laughs> Come on, gotta give us some more descriptions of what it tastes like. Without like saying the fruit? Yeah. This is hard. JT. Um. Like, is it smooth? Is it <laughs> squishy? It's kind of squishy, I guess. Uh. All right, well, maybe Katie can do a better description. Caitlin ate a pear. Okay. All right. All right we'll you can take your, <laughs> take your blindfold off now, Caitlin. And you can hold the mic for Katie. Open it. Open it. There you go. Um, it's sweet and kind of like smooth, I guess. Um... It's really sweet. There we go. <laughs> how, how else would you describe what you ate? It's mushy. Okay. <laughs> I give up. 
<laughs> All right. I guess she can't describe what she ate either. So this, uh, this may work backwards of how I expected it to work tonight. Thanks. Anyway, she had a mandarin orange. Oh, the mandarin orange. You didn't so, know No? I was expecting things like, you know, a pear is kind of gritty. And an orange is, like, juicy. And... I don't know, maybe citrusy, something like that. You know, things to help you understand what just went in their mouth. Anyway, so we'll go back to love here for a few minutes. Um, in the culture that we live in, love is easy come, easy go. Right? It's, it's whatever is in your best interest you love. If it's not in your best interest, you don't have to care. And you can love it today, and you can be indifferent tomorrow. And that can range anything on the gambit that we listed of things, right? I mean, from our food we love today and don't like it tomorrow, to familial relationships in our culture, it's... I love it today, and I don't need it tomorrow. So let's look a little bit um, at one place where the Bible talks about love. Uh, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 5. And I think a couple of the verses might be up here, but I'm going to start a little before that. Uh, we'll be looking at 22 and 23 on the screen. I'm going to go back to verse 18. And Paul's talking to the Galatians. And uh, he's been explaining to them what it means to live life in the, in the Spirit and in Christ. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, that's always a good word, but... The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So the, uh, the Greek word for love here is a specific word um, that we use to describe the type of love that God has for us and the way that we are supposed to love him back as well as the way that we're supposed to love our fellow Christians. Um, the, that word is agape. We've all probably heard that word before. And so as I was studying this passage about the, the fruit of the Spirit, um, there was something that kept jumping out at me. And if we put it back up here again, we'll notice that, uh, that'll work too. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It's one fruit that the Spirit produces. And as I was reading it and doing my study and commentaries and stuff, it, uh, it seems that that the fruit that the Spirit produces is love. <clears throat> and what it seems to be saying here, that, that Paul's trying to say, is the fruit of the Spirit is love. And love tastes like joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So as Paul's trying to describe to someone who does not know what he's talking about when he's using this term for love, he's going to do a better job explaining what they're 
getting than our volunteers did in explaining what they ate. <clears throat> and Paul recognizes the importance of being able to share. When I say love, this is what we mean. This is what God's love is. This is how we live in relationship, loving one another. So first, let's just take a look at love. Paul uses the noun agape 75 times throughout his letters. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he writes to the Corinthians about the gifts of the Spirit. And a discussion leads to Paul pointing them to the most excellent way. And the most excellent way is love. Um, that leads into chapter 13 that uh, you may know as the love chapter, where Paul goes through and he lists all the attributes and characteristics of love. It's patient, it's kind, it's on and on and on. It doesn't envy and so forth. And finally, he says, love is the greatest virtue. Uh, earlier up in chapter 5 of Galatians, <clears throat> loving others as yourself sums up the entire law. Love begins with fellow believers, but it doesn't end there. It, goes, it starts with believers and then goes on to the rest of the world. And I'll throw a bunch of scriptures at you. We don't have time to look them all up. Um, that all talk about that. It's Galatians 6, 10. Ephesians 1, 15 and 4, 2. Colossians 1, 4 and 7. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, and Philemon 5. Um, God is the ultimate source of love in Romans chapter 5, as well as in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. And we know from 1 John that God himself is love. So there's a little background on what, what love all is. So then... When we say love tastes like joy, well, what does that mean? What is joy? When we think of joy, um, a lot of the time, we, the first thing we think of is happiness. Or maybe we say, well, it's like a deep, internal, spiritual happiness. Uh, kind of a picture that comes to my mind when I think of joy is um, when people are often we think first in a relationship with someone and that first those first feelings of love that happen <clears throat> and you can have the worst day you have ever had and you've just been beat down but you know at the end of the day you're going to get to go and see that person there's nothing about that day no matter how bad it is that's going to get you down you've got that joy so deep because you're going to go see that person you love Right? It's that, only way better is the joy that comes from the love of God. <clears throat> it's the ability to be glad and grateful during trouble and loss. And this can only come from a gift of God. So then what is peace? Well, peace comes from the Hebrew idea of shalom. And uh, shalom was a typical greeting for the Hebrews. They, you know, like we would say hello, they would say shalom. It's not just the absence of conflict, which is kind of what we tend to think of when we think of peace. Um, the world's at peace as long as there's not a war, right? But really the idea of shalom is a wholeness. It's health, it's well-being, and fulfillment. Um, paid debts are shalom. Kept vows are shalom. And resolved conflicts are shalom. So peace is calm during the storm. Um, one night when I was going to Mid-America, we were sitting in our dorm, and we started noticing some lightning. <clears throat> and being a brilliant 
men that we were, there was no rain. So we said, hey, let's watch the lightning. So we went out to the lobby of the dorm, picked up couches, carried them out into the parking lot, set them down in the parking lot, and sat in the parking lot and watched lightning all around us, right? But we, we were completely at peace. We were calm in the storm, so we didn't see any reason to be concerned. Now, looking back, it might have been stupid. I don't know. I'd probably do it again. But that's the picture, right? It's a, it's a calm during the storm, knowing though there's a storm brewing all around us. We're okay. Everything is at ease because of what Christ has done. So our next one is patience. <clears throat> and patience is an interesting word. It actually combines two words in Greek. And uh, I'm not going to tell you the Greek words. <clears throat> but our English translation is long and anger. I'm like, yes, I can identify with that. I can get angry and stay there for a long time. I have patience. That is not, not what patience means. Um, it means it takes us a long time to release our wrath. Not necessarily to get angry. We might get angry. But we're going to take a long, it's going to take a long time to release that wrath. It means that we're going to give others a second and third and fourth and fifth and etc., 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 a chance to get it right. Patience forgives before it's asked. And patience sees others for what they are. I'm sorry, not for what they are, but for what they can be through the grace of God. Next, we come to kindness. The quality of being helpful or beneficial. Goodness or generosity. Um, kindness is one of the words most often used to describe the character of God. <clears throat> kindness is responding in grace in our interpersonal relationships when anger might be the expected outcome or expected response. Basically synonymous with kindness is goodness. It's another one used repeatedly to describe the character of God. It's a positive moral quality Characterized by the interest in the welfare of others. <clears throat> Goodness is the loving actions and the con that contribute to the building up, well-being, and salvation of others. Next, we come to faithfulness. And faithfulness is it's the same word that we use to describe our response to God's calling us towards justification. Um, the rabbinical thought placed on faithfulness is complete obedience to the law. Now Paul tells us multiple times through all his various writings that we're not under the law. So obviously he can't mean that we are following the law to the letter. So what he means is a lifelong loyalty and an obedience to God. It's not a momentary thing, but it's an ongoing way of life. At the same time, it's not something that requires a certain number of years to accomplish. It requires from here forward. Faithfulness is a statement of solidarity and loyalty within the community of faith. 
gentleness. Gentleness is an interesting concept. Because so often with gentleness, we put weakness. We think if something is gentle, it's weak. Or um, vulnerable. But really, gentleness is not being overly impressed by a sense of our own self-importance. Another way of saying it's humility. Ah, we went to school with a guy who liked to tell me all the time that he's the most humble guy I knew, he knew. I tell you right now, Dave, I'm the most humble guy I know. I would say maybe you should check that their attitude. Because it seems to me that you might be missing the point of humility. Um, it's courtesy. Consider it. It's meekness. Throughout the New Testament, the embodiment of gentleness is Jesus. Aristotle tells us that gentleness is the golden mean between excessive anger and the inability to be angry. So gentleness isn't just being rolled over all the time. It's the ability to control our emotions and our reactions. A proper picture of gentleness might be the athlete who strives at his sport and takes all his emotions and his frustrations and everything else and channels them to make himself better at his sport and better at the, the game he's playing or the race he's running to properly control those emotions. Completely different picture of gentleness than what we generally tend to think of when we think of the word gentle. Uh, finally, a self-control. A restraint of emotions, desires, and impulses. Uh, Self-control figured prominently in Greek philosophy. We had some friends who came over to our house one time. I think it was when our twins were born. <clears throat> Their son, I think he was around two, is what we figured out based on everything. They came over to, to see the girls and we're sitting around talking and, you know, he's being a two-year-old. And uh, they started to get frustrated with him. And they go, you need to practice self-control. And Sherry and I went, <clears throat> what is wrong with you? Oh, we didn't tell them that, but in our minds, we're thinking, what kind of person tells a two-year-old to practice self-control? They don't even know what self is, let alone control. So, on top of that, right, the New Testament considers self-control to only be possible with the assistance of God. So not only can a two-year-old not control themselves, we can't control ourselves. Unless God's helping us. Self-control is pictured in Paul's remaining single and chaste. That's the, that's the picture he's giving, is the, the reliance upon God to hold himself in check to his natural desires. and So, have you ever tasted your dinner and something about it tasted familiar, but maybe you just couldn't place quite what it was? For me, there's one food that I can always taste. And unfortunately, I hate that food. But I can never, ever miss it in anything that it's in. And that's coconut. And there have been a couple times that I've been eating something, and I'm like, this is good, but there's something just, just eating at me that I cannot handle it. And I have to go look up 
the ingredients. And sure enough, there it is, coconut. Like, that's the problem. That's why there's just something not sitting quite right with me about eating it. So the fruit of the Spirit should be that kind of evident in our lives. <clears throat> People shouldn't be able to ignore it. They shouldn't be able to look at us and just not see it. But as we interact with people, they should be saying, there's something there. I don't know if I can necessarily name it, but there's something there. And if they, they look and dig into it, then they're going to discover well, that it's the fruit of the Spirit. I know that's what's happening in their life. And when it's people that are in the church, right, we should be able to identify it immediately. There's the fruit of the Spirit. So Paul really wraps this up pretty well in the, the next two verses here, 24 and 25. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that you uh, come and that you're the one who gives us love and you're the one who produces fruit in our lives. We ask that you would um, place a desire in us to continue to uh, lean more and more on you to improve that fruit and to make that fruit more recognizable to everyone around us. Go with us this week and uh, just help us to, to be the fruit of you to the people around us, especially as we'll be talking about things like the shooting that's happened today in Texas. Just help us to represent you to the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Pastor JT has been sharing, for, uh, sharing with us the teachings of Paul uh, from the letter to uh, the church at Galatia. And I thought it would be appropriate for us to receive the blessing that Paul gave to the church in Rome. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.